Okay, I think we can start. So welcome everybody to this uh, uh, seminar. This is the fourth seminar of this series uh, dedicated to the many contributions of Giorgio Parisi to theoretical physics. And uh, it is also the last seminar of the year. So we will start again next year in February. So we will have another 10 seminars next year. Uh, the topic today is QCD, the theory of strong interactions. And uh, um, in particular, it's a perturbative QCD. We will also have some other, uh, a couple of seminars on non-perturbative aspects of QCD next year. Um, so as you know, we have selected the topics by looking at the most cited paper by, by Giorgio. And uh, this is one uh, of these most cited paper, Asymptotic Freedom in Part on Language, which, which was written in uh, 1977 with Guido Altarelli, who sadly passed away a few years ago. And um, uh, it is actually one of, probably one of the most well-known papers in, uh, in particle physics in the, in the high energy physics community. Uh, it counts uh, almost 8,000 citations on the Inspire database. And I've checked yesterday, and uh, if I sort uh, the, the papers on the database by the number of citations, it, and I remove the PDG and uh, the big experimental uh, papers, uh, it is number 11. So it's really remarkable. It's the 11th most cited papers in particle physics of all times. But you know, the contributions of Giorgio to, to QCD are not restricted to this only paper. There are several others, and uh, this will be subject of the uh, seminar today. And the speaker that we have uh, is uh, Stefano Forte. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Uh, Stefano is full professor at the uh, University of Milano Statale. He, he came from Turin, where he studied uh, undergraduate uh, uh, when well, he was an undergraduate student, and then he moved to MIT under the supervision of Roman uh, Jakiv. And uh, then uh, he went to Saclay, CERN, Turin again, and Rome for almost five years, Rome three, And then he moved to, to Milan uh, about 20 years ago, more or less. Uh, Stefano is uh, a renowned expert on uh, QCD. And one of his uh, main activities nowadays is the determination of parton distribution functions, uh, which are intimately connected with the topic uh, of this paper. And he's the leader of the NNPDF collaboration who revolutionize, I would say, uh, I think, the way PDFs are determined from, from data by using machine learning techniques. And uh, well, he is uh, also involved in many uh, uh, activities uh, of the high energy physics community, but I don't want to, to steal more time. I think you can uh, start your seminar. So thanks very much for being here and you can start. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Marco for this lavish introduction. So the uh, paper that gives the title to my talk today is actually uh, the culmination of a number of uh, papers of developments uh, of which uh, Giorgio has been an author. Uh, this does not seem to work. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I guess what we had to kind of get unstuck the slides. Right. So, it's a culmination of a number of papers that are really at the heart of the development of what is modern perturbative QCD. And uh, I guess I should start with a disclaimer, uh, which is the following. I mean, I, I realize that most of the talks in this series are given either by co-authors of Giorgio uh, on the paper or on uh, uh, you know, very closely related topics. Um, uh, I'm sure that in this case, the co-author of, of, uh, of the paper that gives the name to the talk would have given a much better talk than mine, not, not just because Obviously, he knew, you know, he had an insider view, but also in terms of, of, uh, of science. Now, e even though I, I, I spent a, a, a very large number of hours discussing with Guido, we actually never talked about uh, this paper or indeed his old papers because Guido did not like to talk about the past. So uh, the disclaimer is the following that uh, I, of course, know very well the uh, uh, paper with the Atarelli-Parisi equation, which I studied as a student, even though I was a 
PhD student about 10 years after the paper was written, it was already a classic. Um, I knew several more papers by Giorgio uh, that are related to this line of thought, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't have an insider view and many more papers I actually discovered over the last several weeks uh, as I was preparing today's talk. So, so you know, uh, what I'm trying to, what I will try to give is some kind of, uh, you know, uh, personal uh, uh, reconstruction of, uh, of the line of thought which is behind these developments and uh, I'm of course very honored to have uh, uh, Georgia sitting in the front row and you know I thank you for this invitation and uh, you know I hope that I'm not going to say anything silly and if I do uh, uh, you know I'll be grateful for uh, to to Georgia for uh, you know corrections or or you know uh, telling me what what I misunderstood or or I got wrong uh, now uh, the contributions of Georgia to perturbative QCD uh, are very numerous and they are concentrated in a, a very short span of times so they are uh, all written between 1970 and 1980 uh, uh, if I define you know, perturbative QCD in the narrow way, so not including lattice, not including um, subsequent non-perturbative developments. Uh, it's about 40 papers out of more than 100 that, that Giorgio wrote uh, uh, using these, these years. And, and you know, uh, they can more or less uh, be grouped into uh, uh, broad categories. Uh, a number of papers written in the early 70s, which have to do with uh, understanding Birkin scaling and the Parton model, uh, and and then uh, uh, a larger number of papers written uh, in the rest of the de decade and partly overlapping with these that have to do with understanding scaling violations and which indeed are the ones that lead to perturbative QCD. And you know when you look at these papers, uh, you know looking at these papers in the last several weeks, one thing that struck me is that often people have the impression that the standard model was most mostly born and developed on the other side of the ocean. And, and you know, it's clear once you look at this that this is uh, absolutely not the case. I mean, not just the Altrelli Parisi equation, but there is a number of things that, that clearly were developed uh, uh, either here or in Paris or in other European institutions where George and his uh, collaborators uh, were working. Uh, now, uh, just to give an impression uh, uh, of the papers having to do with this first uh, uh, set of topics related to the Parton models, I'm showing here, uh, you know, it's very small, but it's just to give a, get a visual impression. It's the list of papers uh, that George wrote from the very beginning, downloaded uh, from Spires uh, uh, up to, well, I mean, yeah, I guess the first uh, uh, 30 or 40. The red cross is perturbative QCD papers. The green cross, it's actually QED papers, which, however, introduce techniques that will be relevant for subsequent QCD developments. And then, you know, you can, you can check out the titles of other pieces of work. Many of these papers have to do with conformal, conformal invariance, conformal field theory, uh, calculations of critical indices. So that's really statistical mechanics, uh, but you can see that that you know uh, the part of the model and QCD play a dominant role, and and uh, these papers have a. A set of common themes um, that are mostly related uh, to the desire of understanding the phenomenological consequences of the theory that was being developed. So as, as we shall see uh, in the remainder of the talk, many of the ideas that happened, at least as I, as I see them by reading the papers, were something that comes from uh, uh, an actual desire of being able to tell by looking at the data uh, what's, what's actually happened. So, uh, you know, first set of papers has to do with the phenomenological consequences of scaling, and then understanding what is the nature of partons, which as I'm going to say in a few minutes was not at all obvious at the time, and then explaining the origin of scaling possibly with conformal invariance, which is related to the other uh, uh, subject that Georgia was working on at the time, and then developing computational techniques and on this uh, you know I at least had a surprise uh, discovering some some developments uh, again as we shall see now this is the earliest paper that that Georgia wrote on 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 perturbative QCD uh, 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 it's called hadron production in e plus e minus collisions of course Georgia was working in Frascati where the uh, Adone uh, uh, in the e plus e minus collider was actually collecting data so that was something that was uh, real and this you know this paper presents uh, 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 what uh, uh, 
we currently teach to students as the computation of the R ratio, the ratio of the uh, uh, cross section for total cross section for producing hadrons divided by muons in E plus E minus uh, uh, collisions. And, and uh, you know, the paper gives right away the result, which is, of course, again, the result, the leading order result we teach to students, which is uh, uh, the sum of the square of the electric charges of partons, uh, except that the only thing which is maybe unusual here is that there are both spin zero and spin a half charged partons, which of course, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, which is something which uh, we don't have now, and it is related to the fact that at the time it was not at all clear um, what partons are. Now, the way this result is, is, is derived is actually quite interesting because the way the calculation starts is exactly the same way you find in uh, you know, Peskin's uh, textbook. I mean, you start by writing the cross section in terms of a, a, a two point correlation function of the electromagnetic current. Uh, and then you say you get it from, from the imaginary part, from the absorptive part. And uh, you know the way we would do it in modern language is you then use the Wilson expansion and then you say the dominant operator is the vacuum and then you go and calculate vacuum polarization and so on. While here, uh, you know, the Wilson expansion was being born at this time. It was clearly not a usual tool. So a kinematic argument is used instead. The kinematic argument is that hadrons are produced mostly as a, a pair of back-to-back -back jets. Uh, these jets do not talk to each other. There is no, uh, uh, at high energy, there is no PT transfer, uh, transfer between them. And therefore, you can actually calculate uh, uh, the uh, two-point function as if it were the matrix element of free currents, which then produces the desired results. Now, as I said, the nature of partons or what, what partons are was not at all clear at the time. And in fact, there is a number of papers, including the one which I'm showing here, which have to do with asking the question, can we actually tell what partons are? And, you know, this paper starts with an interesting sentence, which is, uh, you know, there are two possibilities. Partons are identified with quarks or, or other mythical constituents of the hadrons, uh, uh, or else partons are actually, uh, you know, Masons and variants. Um, and, and the paper here was then taking the point of view that the latter possibility uh, should be taken seriously. And then if so, uh, you know, if, if, if partons are hadrons, then deep elastic scattering would not involve the structure of the proton because the idea is that a virtual incoming photon produces, uh, uh, you know, hadron anti-hadron pair, which then interacts uh, with, with the proton. Uh, but the interesting thing is that then, you know, making this hypothesis, one can actually calculate predictions, for example, for the ratio of uh, longitudinal to transverse uh, cross sections, which allows you to tell which uh, uh, is the case. Now, interestingly, some of the parton model results that were derived by, by Georgia at this time are now considered to be classic parton model results. One is the, what is normally called these days the Gottfried sum rule, which is derived in this single author paper as a duality sum rule. So it's derived, uh, uh, so the sum rule is the integral of the first moment of the proton minus neutron uh, structure function, which is equal to a third. Um, the modern derivation in leading order QCD is based on using isospin, which says that the number of up, up, up quarks, so that the up quark distribution in the proton is equal to the down quark distribution of the neutron and conversely, and also making uh, an approximate uh, SU2 symmetric hypothesis for the nucleon C, which now we know not to be uh, fully correct, but rather to be violated. But, but you know, this uh, derivation uh, was, uh, standard until maybe uh, 15, 20 years ago when people started seeing deviations. Uh, in this paper instead, the result is actually derived without using directly a parton picture by assuming uh, that the deep elastic scattering process is dominated by T-channel resonance exchange so that the structure function are written as a sum of resonance contribution, which are classified with uh, F and D SU3 coupling, singlet and octet, uh, uh, you know, with a plus sign for the proton and the minus sign for the neutron for the SU3, SU2 ones, and then using SU3 symmetry, which produces the same result that we get today, which is driven by indeed SU2 symmetry. Um, as I said, a major line of development at this time was trying to understand what is the origin of Birkin scaling. And the natural hypothesis was that uh, scaling 
uh, might be related to scale invariance on, uh, of the underlying theory. So, for example, in this paper from 1972, what Giorgio does is uh, make a number of assumptions which are basically related to the existence of an untrivial fixed point of the beta function uh, of QCD, from which one then derives a proof which is based on the following syllogism that you know canonical light cone singularities imply that the zero mass theory is free. But Birkin scaling implies canonical light cone singularities and product, products of currents. So Birkin scaling implies uh, 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 that the zero mass theory is free. So uh, the Parton model at, at, at short distances, which is uh, you know an interesting uh, uh, possibility, which turned out not to be what actually happens, but was natural enough at the time. So uh, I mentioned that some of the papers written at this time were actually uh, QED rather than QCD. Uh, uh, and I'd like to mention uh, one or two, which are I, which I found remarkable. I didn't know of them because of the techniques they introduce. So the first of these two papers uh, is a computation of uh, uh, photon radiation in E plus E minus. So the process E plus E minus going into E plus E minus gamma, which is actually computed using the Weizsäcker-Williams approximation, which has I guess most people or many people in the audience know, and as we are going to see, will play an important role in the ultra early Parisi paper. Uh, and then uh, uh, the result found using Weizsäcker Williams is compared to the exact result, and it's surprisingly found to agree with it, even in the region uh, of large angle photon scattering, while Weizsäcker Williams would only hold, uh, should only hold for small transfer momentum. But then the really interesting thing, which I discovered, is the way the exact calculation is done. So the exact calculation is presented in a uh, uh, different paper where the following interesting statement is made. Um, uh, we find the helicity amplitudes directly. The main simplification is due to the fact that if the number of Feynman diagrams which contribute is n, there are n terms in the helicity amplitudes, but n square in the usual expression for a square. And then you get a list of uh, 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 you know, formula which has what we would call in present day Mangano Park formula. So, uh, you know, maybe if Giorgio had kept working on this, we would have had the uh, um, uh, helicity formalism in, 19, in the 1970s instead of having to wait until the 2010s. But, uh, okay, that's not the way history happened, but still I found this uh, uh, development remarkable. Now, this brings me to the subsequent uh, line of development. Here, I'm not even trying to show you all the paper. I just show you a snapshot of some of the papers which were written around asymptotic freedom in Parton language. Still, the fraction of red papers, uh, so you know, QCD papers is 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 uh, striking. It's uh, maybe half of them. Uh, the other topics that Georgia was working on uh, started being more diverse. Uh, there are many papers that have to do with the high order behavior of perturbation theory, which I'm gonna. Uh, mentioned briefly at the end of my talk. So, uh, you know, asymptotic estimates in quantum electrodynamics, asymptotic estimates uh, in, in theory with fermions. There are many papers about, um, um, there start being papers about non-perturbative methods, uh, but still uh, uh, an important focus is on perturbative QCD. Now, the common themes of uh, this uh, uh, line of thought that occupied Georgia for, uh, the best part of the decade uh, is understanding uh, the violations of scaling. So understanding anomalous dimensions and scale dependence, and again, trying to relate the then uh, dominant formalism of uh, uh, OPE, Wilson expansion, to something closer to the data. So something closer to, uh, you know, Feynman diagrams that correspond to the processes you actually see in the lab. Uh, and then uh, uh, once uh, this program was accomplished through the Altrelli Parisi paper, uh, uh, trying to follow some of the perturbative QCD phenomenology and then trying to push the theory further by looking at all order behavior and, and you know, the birth of what is modern QCD resumation. Now, uh, the first paper that, that uh, Georgia wrote, or that at least the one I, that I found about scaling violations, is a paper which is uh, quite early, 72, so it overlaps with the time when uh, uh, he was still thinking about uh, Birkin scaling. And, you know, the paper 
which is again single author, experimental limits on the values of Hamas dimensions, starts with this uh, 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 striking sentence. It is known that the arcane scaling is violated because of the appearance of annoying logs of Q square. And, uh, and then, you know, one tries to show how the annoying logs of Q square appear. And, you know, this is the first time, at least, that I saw the modern Mellin moment formalism showing up. So the idea is if you're right, uh, if you look at the Mellin moments of uh, structure functions or of uh, part and distributions, instead of looking at the physical momentum space, then you realize that they have a very simple decoupled Q square dependence. They depend on scale as the scale raised to some power, or if you prefer, as the exponential of an anomalous dimension times the log of the scale itself. So the logs of the scale exponentiate, and the coefficient of the exponentiation is, is given by an anomalous dimension. Now, this paper, um, is still related to trying to understand the arcane scaling. So why do we see scaling despite the fact the scaling is violated? And it suggests the following idea. So the paper is based on having an ansatz for the anomalous dimension, which is written here. So it's a kind of guess. Uh, this guess can be viewed as the Mellin transform of some function, which I wrote here. And then uh, uh, one notices that if the moments of the structure function behave like this, then this means that the structure function itself behaves in a way which is shown here. Uh, so it is driven by the behavior of this function here. And then if one looks at the way, so uh, omega here is one over X, where X is Birkin X, the fraction of the momentum carried by the partons. And in, if one then looks at the, at the scale depends in this equation, one finds uh, that it has a shape like this. So it changes sign, and which means that if one is sitting for actual data in the region of uh, one over x equal 10, so x equal 0.1, then you know, the function has a zero and there is approximate, even though not exact scaling. Now, um, it turns out that uh, this idea is almost correct. I mean, what I'm showing here is a plot from Dick Roberts's old uh, textbook from the uh, uh, mid nineties, uh, and it shows this same function, now as a function of x, which is the reciprocal of omega. So you see that the, qualitative behavior and the change of sign around point one is right. What, unfortunately, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the slope is wrong in the sense that this goes down as omega increases while this goes down as one over omega increases. But the idea that there is a, an approximate fixed point in the middle where the data sit is, is actually uh, uh, essentially correct. The other interesting observation is that uh, this whole line of argument is based on looking at the evolution of moments, and then turning that into an equation for the evolution of the structure function. Now, this is motivated by the desire of having predictions for something you actually measure, which is the structure function. But what it does is it produces something which starts being very close to the Altarelli Parisi equation as we know it now, because the approximate, sorry, because the uh, uh, product uh, uh, structure of Mellin moments turns into a convolution structure, uh, uh, see, using the Falton theorem, which means convolution theorem of Mellin moments of Mellin transform, one finds. So one starts thinking about, uh, uh, you know, anomalous dimensions being the Mellin transform of something that we would call and was called splitting function, which is then convoluted with the structure function itself. Um, at the same time, uh, George and collaborators were asking a number of questions like, can one compute the anomalous dimension? So the, at this point, the anomalous dimensions had been computed by the, by the American group of Gross, Wilshire, Politzer, um, uh, using asymptotic freedom. Uh, uh, and so there is an attempt to relate the anomalous dimensions to anomalous dimensions of the fundamental underlying fields. And there's also the question, can one actually measure them in experiment? Uh, there is this very nice paper written together with uh, Guido Tarelli and Roberto Petronzio, where one finds a plot of the second moment. So these are the momentum fractions carried by valence, uh, C, gluon. Uh, this is a completely modern plot. I mean, this you find in, in, in present day phenomenology papers. And the idea is that then by looking at the scale dependence of the momentum fractions carried by the different kind of constituents, you could actually verify whether the anomalous dimensions are, are right or wrong. Um, but, uh, um, you know, the paper which I, I did not, well, I vaguely knew about, but I found most striking, so that I'm reproducing most of it here, is, is a paper which uh, uh, Georgia wrote uh, pretty early in 1974, 
uh, trying again to ask the question, can we phenomenologically see uh, anomalous dimensions in structure functions as we measure them? And, and the answer uh, Giorgio gave was the following. So, you know, he starts again by noticing that the moments, the Mellin moments of the structure function behave like log Q square raised to a power and the power is the anomalous dimension. By this time, the anomalous dimension had been calculated. So this is no longer a conjecture, but it's the result of the calculations by Gross, which are you know, the founding fathers of perturbative QCD. And then Giorgio makes the following very striking, surprising observation. So the aim of this note it is, is to point out that it is possible to derive from two, two is just scaling with anomalous dimension, simple consequences on the Q-square behavior of the structure function of fixed omega. And what is written here is basically the Altarelli Parisi equation, which is obtained by simply looking at the scale dependence of moments of structure function, and then noticing that uh, if you take an inverse Mellin transform and you look at this as the solution of a differential equation, then you get a, an integral differential equation for the structure function which tells you that the scale dependence, the logarithmic scale dependence of the structure function is given by the convolution of some function, which is the inverse Mellin transform of the anomalous dimension with the structure function itself, which is of course the Altarelli Parisi equation, which is here found by completely, you know, formal mathematical manipulation. And in fact, the comment that Giorgio makes is, uh, uh, you know, these two formulations, the operator and the uh, and, uh, uh, you know, convolution formulation are mathematically equivalent. However, we believe that the second equation is easier to test. So uh, you see, um, it looks like the motivation is, 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 is not, not yet trying to understand where it comes from, but rather whether you can actually see it in the data, which I found quite interesting. And uh, by the time we get to 1976, actually, the Altarelli Parisi equation as we know it now starts appearing and is first presented in a set of uh, uh, lectures uh, that uh, uh, Giorgio gave at the Morion conference. You can still find the uh, uh, write up. Uh, uh, um, they have a note which says part of the results presented here have been obtained by the author in collaboration with uh, Guido Altarelli and Roberto Petronzio. And then, as we shall see in the beginning of the Altarelli Parisi paper, there is the reciprocal sentence, some of the results presented here were already published in, and uh, you know, this is, is shown. And, and you can see the abstract, which starts being very close to what we know as the uh, major Altarelli Parisi breakthrough, namely the theory scaling violation in deep elastic scattering is presented using the Parton model language, you know, asymptotic freedom in Parton language. Intuitive physical arguments are used as far as possible. And then in the comparison between a theory experiment, particular attention is paid to consequence of opening of the threshold for charm. So again, it is remarkable that there is this guide, guiding principle of trying to actually see things in the data. Now, uh, I'll just spend a few minutes about uh, uh, this uh, uh, preview of the uh, uh, actual Trelli Parisi paper and then move to that. But uh, uh, I cannot resist, resist the temptation of showing you a couple of gems that are to be found in this paper. So the first part of, of, of this set of lecture, uh, lectures is actually doing QED rather than QCD. And what it does is it describes what we would modern Call uh, 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 parton showering or rather photon showers in QCD in QED. So uh, there is a chapter which is in, entitled "The Constituents of the Electron," where the line of argument is an electron can radiate a photon, and then a photon can ra radiate an e plus e minus pair, and then the e plus and e, mi e minus uh, in turn radiate photons, and then you get the showering process, which can be described by two equations, which are the Altarelli Parisi equations, uh, except the for QED, they are modernly known as the Griebelton path of equation because they had been developed by the Russians uh, uh, completely independently, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and then, well, so, so there is this uh, nice uh, lengthy discussion of QED before moving, mo moving to QCD. Uh, this is followed by a, uh, a, an interesting chapter which um, reproduces uh, a description or a you know, physical picture of asymptotic freedom that is now to be found in any textbook. I mean, you open Peskin and you find it. So the idea is you first start with QED and you observe that in QED, if a photon splits into an E plus E minus pair, then the vacuum can behave as a dielectric because the E plus E minus pair aligns with the field and therefore it screens the charge. So when you go afar, 
you actually see <clears throat> At long distances, um, uh, you actually see a, a, a smaller charge, and when you get closer, so at high energy in QED, you see a bigger charge, but then Giorgio says uh, something strange can happen, which is the opposite. So you can have uh, something which is called the en enantion. Uh, you know, I didn't go to a classical high school, so I didn't study Greek, but I guess this means something which behaves in the opposite way, which means that the vacuum anti-screens, which of course is what we know now happens because of gluons, and then you get the anti-screening picture, and then you get asymptotic freedom, because when you're closer to the charge, instead of it being larger, it's actually smaller, which is asymptotic freedom. Okay, uh, and, and then after this nice physical picture is given, the QCD ultra early Parisi equations are written down in full, but there is no derivation of the splitting function. There is no calculation of the splitting function. So this is the only thing that is missing in comparison to the subsequent paper. And then there is a very detailed comparison to data, including an extensive discussion of charm, which at the time was a, a novelty because we were talking about 1976 and the, you know, the JSI revolution from, was from a couple of years earlier. And this brings me to the paper that gives the title to uh, this talk. Uh, I'm reproducing here the whole front page because uh, uh, you know, I think it's worth uh, taking a look at the paper and then I would spend some time uh, walking you through the actual calculation in the paper. Of course, it's a textbook calculation these days. And this is one of these papers where the original presentation is, you know, sometimes when you look at old papers, you look at them and they are impossible to understand. But there are rare cases in which instead you look at the original paper and the presentation is so nice and clear that all subsequent textbooks basically reproduce it with maybe some small variation. Uh, so, you know, the rest of the calculation is essentially identical up to some small detail that I will comment upon to what you find again in Peskin's textbook or in, in any textbook, but it's still worth uh, having a look. But before doing that, uh, I'd like to briefly call your attention on both the uh, uh, abstract and, and, and starting sentence because that uh, allows one to appreciate what this paper is really about. So, you know, the abstract is similar to that of, of the Morion proceedings, so a novel derivation of the Q-square Q dependence of quark and gluon densities. So now it's quark and gluon densities, not structure functions. Predicted by quantum chromodynamics is presented. The main uh, body of predictions for deep elastic scattering, polarized or unpolarized, can be reobtained by a method which only makes use of the simplest tree diagrams, and it's entirely phrased in Farton language. And then, you know, the first sentence says this in an alternative derivation of um, modern being Gross, Wilczek, and so on results on the Q square behavior of DIS. Uh, and in this approach, all stages of the calculation refer to part and concept. This is the title of the paper, after all, asymptotic freedom in part on language. Uh, and in our opinion, the present approach, uh, although less general, is remarkably simpler uh, because results can derive in a direct way from the ba basic vertices of QCD with no loop calculation being involved. So you see, what, what this paper is really about is understanding the underlying physics uh, of scaling violations as found using the Wilson expansion, which is something that sometimes people don't appreciate. I mean, I've seen sometimes, you know, people saying, well, this should be called the DGLAP equation because it was written by Dokshitz or Gzibov Ripatov in previous paper. Um, of course, you know, you can call things uh, any way you want, but, um, uh, you know, a friend of mine used to say that calling this the DGLAP equation is like asking whether the Vikings discovered America. Uh, which means the following, that, you know, when we say discover America, we don't mean that someone went to America and set foot there. Uh, we mean that someone understood that, you know, there are the, you know, the earth is round and you could get to uh, some continent, which is on the other side of the ocean, uh, and then come back and, you know, understanding what that means. Uh, it's not just putting the foot there. So, you know, discovering something does not mean just writing the equation, but understanding what it means. Yes. May I add that this is another Giorgio paper, because... George always says that the important thing is not discover something first, but discover it last. Okay, I didn't know that, but uh, yeah. But, uh, okay, no, I, so George always says that what is important is not discovering something first, but discovering something last. And this is exactly what you say. Right. And he says about America. Okay, yeah. Well, this, this this was a fellow graduate student of mine that used to say that when we were studying this for our general examination at MIT, and you know, and and you know, and said, like, come on, I mean, uh, but he had this quote, and uh, yeah, then he left for Wall Street. Uh, 
Okay, so let me now get through, I mean, walk you through the Altarelli Parisi derivation because it's, uh, you know, it's such a classic that it's worth going through once again. You know, it's like when you hear a Beethoven symphony that you've heard so many times, but it's still very nice to hear it because, uh, you know, of the sheer beauty of the art. So the argument starts like the anticipations that I've been talking about uh, 15 minutes ago. So first uh, one takes moments, except that now it's no longer moments of the structure function, it's really moments of the quark distribution. So you have a quark distribution, no longer the structure function. And then you say, as well known, the predicted uh, T, T is log Q squared, the predicted uh, logarithmic dependence of the moments is of the form, and interestingly, the log Q square is not written as log Q square, but it's written as a strong coupling, as alpha S. Of course, alpha S goes like one over log Q square. So it's like log square raised to a power of the anomalous dimension by, well, divided by the first coefficient of beta function because you have the uh, uh, alpha S and not log Q square. And then the observation is, well, this uh, equation here for the Q-square dependence of moments can be viewed as a solution of a simple first-order differential equation for log Q-square with the anomalous dimension, which is kind of trivial. And then by taking the inverse Mellin transform, which was the insight which previously was given as a purely mathematical curiosity, you can rewrite this as the log derivative of the Parton distribution itself, no longer its moments. You take the inverse Mellin transform, which is then the convolution of uh, uh, some function P with the uh, part of distribution itself, where P is the function whose moments, the splitting functions, whose moments are the anomalous dimension. And then, you know, stop. What, what are we saying here? Then there is a comment, well, we can rewrite it in the form, and then the meaning of the equation is clear. Given a quark with momentum Y, there's a chance that it radiates a gluon, thus reducing its energy from Y to X. And, uh, and then you define a differential probability of splitting. And then you understand that this, which looked like a mathematical curiosity, is the inverse Mellin transform of an equation whose solution is something we knew, actually has a direct simple physical interpretation. It describes the part and branching process, which I had in the previous slide in, in QED. Okay, uh, so at this point, uh, the new part of the paper, which was not in the Morion lectures, co comes with a direct calculation of the splitting function from Feynman diagram. And this turns out to be remarkable, remarkably simple, as the abstract of the paper said. I mean, something which you can do by not calculating any loops, just calculating free diagrams. Uh, so it is done in various steps that I'm going to walk you through. So of course, the first step is relating uh, the splitting probability to some splitting function by pulling out a differential factor of t, t is log q square. So you write this as a differential in log q square. And then uh, you calculate the process of radiation by using the White Secker Williams approximation, which, uh, as we saw, appeared in a, in a very old, well, very old, in a much older previous QED paper of Giorgio, uh, where it was used as a device to calculate E plus E minus into E plus E minus gamma. So the idea here is the following I'm drawing it here. This is something which we've seen many times and taught to students. Uh, you have deep elastic scattering, a virtual photon hitting a quark and producing a generic final state F. Now, the quark before. Uh, uh, being hit by the virtual photon radiates a gluon. Um, and then uh, you realize that in the region in which the radiated gluon is almost collinear, is almost parallel to the incoming uh, and outgoing quark, uh, you can treat the intermediate state as an, a quasi real state. You can put it almost on shell, which means that you can, well, you know, the a fermion propagator that appears here. So p slash divided by p square, you can write it as a sum over on shell intermediate state. And then the process splits in half, which is the standard derivation as you find it in, in, in Peskin or in any other textbook, uh, which means that the matrix element can be written as the product of the matrix element of the quark splitting into a quark plus a gluon times the matrix element of the quark absorbing the photon and producing the final state. And of course, the power of the argument is that the radiation process is completely decoupled from the final process, which is happening later. Um, there is a technical detail here, which is uh, 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 peculiar and which I'm going to comment upon in a few minutes. But uh, let me first note that then 
what this means is that if you calculate the cross section for the whole process, because the matrix elements split like this, you can write the cross section as the product of two sub cross sections. So the process really splits into a splitting probability times the final process. And therefore the splitting probability is given by a universal expression, which only depends on this splitting diagram here. And which does not depend on the particular physical process, be it deep elastic scattering, Drelian, Higgs, whatever. It, you know, uh, parton branching is universal and process independent. Uh, the next step is then calculating the splitting probability. So calculating the splitting function. Um, and this is done, this means, you know, calculating uh, this expression here. So if you wish the A, C, B part of the diagram, which I'm drawing here. Now this is done, now this is the peculiar aspect of the calculation. This is done by using so-called old perturbation theory. Old perturbation theory means that you write the momenta for A, B, and C, in such a way that all three of them are on shell, at least to first order in transverse momentum square, because we are looking at the small transverse momentum where you have the collinear singularity, but energy is not conserved. And indeed, you may have noticed that the perturbation expansion formula has an energy denominator, which would be zero. So, you know, it was explode if uh, energy was conserved. Now, using old perturbation theory, uh, uh, you know, the paper says it's not necessary, but it's actually an extremely clever trick because the calculation then becomes much simpler. So if you compare this again to the calculation you find in textbooks like Peskin, it's actually much easier because thanks to the use of old perturbation theory, um, uh, you have to pay the price of not conserving energy, but what you gain is that you have an on-shell intermediate state, and then you can use on-shell spinners so that the calculation of the Feynman diagram reduces to calculating traces in the way we know when you take the square modules of something with external on-shell spinners. In other words, you're putting on-shell the intermediate state here, while if you do it like in Peskin, here you have to have a slightly off-shell uh, state you conserve energy but you have a much more complicated expression for the spinner you cannot do the calculation using traces you have to substitute the explicit expression for the direct spinner so this is a kind of uh, uh, you know technical uh, 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 virtuosity which makes the whole thing much simpler uh, and then you know then computing the splitting function is very simple because you just uh, express the sp splitting probability so you know let me go back you first uh, uh, calculate the phase space with this choice of kinematics. Then you replace the phase space in the expression of the splitting probability. Uh, and the splitting function is then reduces to computing a trace. It's reduced to computing a trace because as I said, you have external on-shell spinners. So then the square modulus is the usual trace like we teach students when we teach them the first computation of QED. It's a completely trivial state, straightforward trace with just four Dirac matrices contracted with a, 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 a photon polarizations and with a color factor. Color and spin sums are very simple and you end up getting the expression for the splitting function. Uh, here I'm showing the expression for uh, PGQ. So a gluon, uh, uh, so finding a gluon inside a quark of course, PQQ, which is finding a quark inside a quark, is the same thing interchanging X into one minus X, which means interchanging B and C. So with one calculation, you actually get two splitting functions. Uh, and then there is the question, how does this relate to the um, operator formulas? Well, we take moments because moments of the splitting function are anomalous dimension. Except that if you take moments, you realize that PQQ and PQG actually diverge. The moments diverge. But then there is the observation, yeah, they diverge because we missed a contribution which comes from loop, loop corrections, except that one does not have to compute it. One just replaces the divergent denominator with uh, what we all now call a plus prescription. So you subtract an endpoint term, which would be the um, loop correction, the virtual correction, which is proportional to a, a delta because the loop correction has the same kinematics as the leading order, the previous order. And then you fix um, the coefficient of the delta by imposing charge conservation or momentum conservation, which then 
allows you to determine the constant without calculating anything and off you go and you get the full set of four anomalous dimensions and then the final comment is this set of logarithmic exponents is seen to coincide with the results of George I posits are gross and Lipschitz, which is uh, uh, almost the end of the paper it's not the end of the paper because the paper keeps following uh, the argument fo forward first of all by redoing the whole calculation in the polarized case so polarized splitting functions are not something that was measured and discussed until the mid 90s i would say but they are fully done here and and because of the way the calculation has been set up it's actually quite easy you just stick in polarization projectors so gamma fives into the intermediate stage of the calculation and then you get the polarized results and then finally there's a the question can we do this beyond the leading order which is really leading log because you're summing the leading loss whole order and the observation is well this argument was so simple because uh, at leading order, the kalan semantic equation can be reduced to a linear differential equation by simply replacing alpha with alpha s of q square. But if you go to next to leading order, then you have to keep track of the mixing of the logs of the running with the logs of the evolution. And this was only done by Kurci, Fomansky, and Petronzio a few years later. But, you know, this kind of sets the stage for this. Um, after this paper, and I'm coming to the end of my talk, uh, uh, George actually published a number of, of phenol papers where, you know, having set up the correct formula is now at this point, uh, perturbative QCD is all there, factorization, all you want. So one can do transverse momentum in Drelian, transverse momentum muon pairs produced in Drelian. You know, I don't have the time to go through the abstracts. So Fino uh, uh, um, uh, developments like parametrizing the Q square depends of quark distributions, we, because at this point you have the equation, you have the solution, but you can do something which is close to modern part and fitting, except that the functional forms were simpler because at the time the data were not so precise. Then jet physics, there are, you know, super inclusive cross sections, which is defining what we call the jet C parameter and sphericity, um, glue and fragmentation from quark jets, uh, and again, uh, uh, sphericity like distribution. So a number of developments which we would call modern jet physics. Let me just go quickly through a couple of these developments to give you the flavor of them. Uh, one has to do with Drelian, uh, where this is a paper written, this one written in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Guido and with Roberto Petronzio, where um, the PT distribution of Drelian pairs in what is currently called the Collins Soper frame is computed. Uh, and uh, uh, in the famous Collins Soper Sturman paper of 1984, where they do for the first time the modern version of PT resummation to next to leading log, they say with the ad advent of QCD factorization, one was able to write the Drelian cross section at measured QT, and then they give it as, as a reference this calculation. So, you know, this was recognized as the birth of. Uh, QCD factorization. Uh, the other paper I'd like to mention is, is, is the one uh, on, uh, you know, su super inclusive variables where one defines this quantity, uh, uh, which is a tensor whose eigenvectors define the modern shape variables, the sphericity, the C parameter, the sphericity, and, and uh, 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 so on. Uh, now, I'd like to spend my last uh, five uh, minutes or so uh, by briefly mentioning um, uh, a final line of development, uh, which has to do with trying to go beyond fixed order perturbative QC. Now, of course, um, uh, much of the work that Georgia was doing in these years had to do with the high order behavior of field theory in general. But, you know, a related line of thought was, uh, are there aspects of perturbative QCD calculations that we can perform to all orders? And, and there are at least two seminal papers uh, in this respect, which have to do with what we would modern in modern language, we we call pseudocov resummation of PT distributions or of uh, you know threshold pseudocov resummation or pseudocov resummation of soft logs. Now, these two papers I'd like to spend a few minutes about because both of them contain some interesting and surprising insights. So the first paper, which is quite famous, I, I guess many people, many practitioners of perturbative QC know it, I, I knew of it, was written together with Roberto Petronzio, and it's the first paper in which transverse momentum resummation is, is included. This is something which is very important because at small PT, a fixed order calculation produces divergent results, while if you sum to all orders, you get a finite result. So you, you're forced, if you want to compare to data uh, at small PT, you're forced to perform this resummation, 
mentioned in, in this paper, this is first done in QED by using the iconal approximation for soft photon emission, and then including running coupling effects uh, uh, to move towards QCD. And, uh, you know, there are a couple uh, uh, important insights here. One is that the running coupling effects are included or resummed correctly by letting the coupling run with the KT, which you are integrating or resumming upon. And the second insight is to use a B space approach. So take the Fourier transform. And that's because uh, if you're doing a transverse momentum di distribution, taking a Fourier transform factorizes the phase space. The delta function that gives you transfer momentum conservation gets factorized, and then you get immediately the result. And then the same Colin Soper Sturman paper, which systematized and produced the modern version of this, uh, you know, they say uh, that the previous error by the Russian school was corrected by Patrizi Parisi and Petroncio this paper, these authors introduced more powerful techniques. They worked with the Fourier transform with respect to QT, and they showed the usefulness of soft gluon methods. So this is really the origin of modern CSS as it is currently known. The other paper is about threshold resummation. Uh, 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 I guess, uh, uh, so here, I'm sorry, I put the wrong, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, apologies, this is not the right citation. The right citation would be the paper down here. Uh, the paper, uh, 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 uh. ah, okay. Uh, uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. No, okay, sorry. So I, I missed the right paper. It's, a, it's a, a paper which is written by George, a single author. I'll replace this in the slide you can put on the website. Um, now this paper does not perform the resummation of PT, but rather uh, resummation of the total center of mass energy for processes like Drelian, or in modern language on modern days, Higgs production. Uh, and, and it contains at least four very important insights. So the first important insight is that resummation, soft resummation, has a kinematic origin. And it has to do with the fact that the maximum value of the transfer of momentum is, is uh, uh, driven by a quantity which is related to a soft scale. So it's a hard scale Q square multiplied by something which is one minus X in Debianastic scattering, one minus X square in Drelian. So when X goes to one, this hard scale becomes a soft scale. And this is what you're resumming. Um, the second uh, insight is that running coupling effects are included by letting the, uh, again, the strong coupling run with the soft scale. Um, and uh, 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 the other important insight is that the resummation is best realized by taking an integral transform, which is now no longer a Fourier transform, but rather a Mellin transform, because Mellin decouples longitudinal momentum like uh, uh, Fourier decouples transfer momentum conservation. And the final interesting intuition is uh, um, a relation between uh, DIS and Drell Yan resummation, and in particular the fact that in the large Q square limit, the ratio of DIS to Drell Yan is driven by an analytic continuation of the law from space-like to time-like, which produces uh, pi square, uh, you know, you have a pi for each log, they are square logs, so you have pi square factors, and then you get an exponentiation of pi squares, which uh, uh, Giorgio describes as being rather doubtful. Uh, of course, because, you know, you're exponentiating constants which are there, but of course there are other constants which you're not exponentiating and which are not universal, and the constant is a constant, it's not like a log. Um, now, this uh, last exponentiation of constants was rediscovered several times. Uh, it's actually proven by George Sturman and, and, and my friend Lorenzo Mania in his PhD thesis in 1990. And then there is a paper by our SCAT friends, uh, Matthias Neubert and collaborator who claimed a huge important discovery in 2009, exactly 30 years after this paper was written where they discover this equation here and they you know, present it as a major breakthrough. So this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, this idea that you could look at the all order behavior of perturbation theory was clearly something potentially interesting and something that might go beyond perturbation theory. Uh, and, 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 and Giorgio worked a lot on trying to study the asymptotic uh, behavior of perturbation theory in field theory. Um, 
by studying the divergence of the expansion of, of field theories in general, gauge theory in particular, studying their Borel summations, singularities in the Borel plane. And, and, and in these lectures from uh, the late 70s, when coming to gauge theories and QCD, Giorgio concludes saying, the reader may think that in spite of our efforts, the situation is still a mess. Uh, that is true. However, in the last few years of progress has been made, we do not know yet how to get correct answers for a field theory of strong interactions, where here, by correct answers, what he meant is you know, non-perturbative QCD, basically. Uh, but we begin to understand which are the right questions to ask. Um, this is one of the last QCD paper, perturbative QCD papers that Georgia wrote. And then he obviously thought that the way of actually answering these questions was by using the lattice. And that is the subsequent line of development, uh, which someone else uh, will be talking about. And therefore, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Stefan. It was a very, very nice uh, seminar. Uh, do we have questions? Ah, yeah. If you want to. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Stefan for this wonderful, like, very careful uh, reconstruction. And uh, I, I would like to add something which you could not probably know that uh, Nicola Cabibbo. It was the uh, one that stressed the, the important that was both the, uh, this is advice of myself and also of uh, of Francesco Givilli stressed the fact that uh, by Zeke Williams type computation because he was doing with Zeke Williams type computation for some processing in a plus and minus adone uh, other processes. And uh, indeed, he pushed us to write down the illicit amplitude and so on. And uh, also, the point is that before the Altavelli Pervisi paper, there is a nice, very nice paper, which unfortunately is only a CERN preprint and published of Cabibbo and Rocca. Rocca was a t uh, Cabibbo was the thesis advisor of Rocca for some reason the paper was just only on the same preprint in which they were doing the computation in electrodynamics of the splitting function in the p-infinity limit. So the idea of using the p-infinity limit is something that Nicola is pushed strongly because he liked it very much. And they did and not only the Vatseke Williams in the P infinity limit, which probably you could find in the text or was done by other people, but it's also computed the, the splitting function for a photon going in a plus and minus pair. So of all the three splitting functions that we need, they are uh, the only one that was missing essentially in Delta Valley Parisi was the gluon, gluon, gluon uh, right. splitting function. The other things, one uh, difference, uh, important difference, fortunately, people do not realize between uh, the Morion lecture note and the Delta Valley Parisi paper that some of the formula of Morion are wrong. There are some mistakes uh, which, oh, I, maybe I was. Well, there are some mistakes in the one of the things that the, something that should be symmetric was not symmetric. So there is some x place, one minus x, and so on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank sure. you again. Thanks. Uh, questions from the audience? Comments? Julia. Just a curiosity, because uh, uh, I was used to associate the jet shapes uh, to fragmentation models, because I was working on that many years ago, 40 years ago, and I didn't know by the, the contribution by Giorgio Parisi. Uh, what, uh, um, which result uh, he obtained, and how do they compare with uh, experiments, uh, if you have some, uh, some information? So, 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 so indeed, uh, so, so, so uh, I, I could look, well, I, I guess maybe Giorgio can answer better than myself. I could locate three papers of Giorgio on jets. 
One indeed is doing fragmentation functions from quark jets, which is using fragmentation models. But the other two are actually defining what we would call in modern language uh, jet shape variables. So one of the two defines a generalized, so this is a, um, a testable QCD predictions for a sphericity like distribution. So it defines a generalized sphericity, uh, which includes what we would call sphericity in modern language. You may know that the original sphericity was not infrared collinear safe. And in this paper, uh, um, the, it, you know, the sphericity is generalized to a general exponent in, in the momenta in the numerator, uh, such that for one particular choice, you actually get the infrared collinear safe variable. And the other, which maybe is, is even more important, is this paper called Super Inclusive Cross-Section, where he says we define super inclusive cross-sections, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, something which is more inclusive than the cross-section itself. And, uh, and uh, uh, so an interesting example of super inclusive quantity is given by the three by three matrix, which is this. And, and this guy here, if you look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, which is sometimes still today called the Parisi matrix, then you realize that one of the eigenvalues is what is called the C parameter, the other is the sphericity. And so, 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 so you have this uh, tensor here uh, constructed out of the uh, uh, momenta of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, PIK are the spatial components of the momentum of the case particle in the center of mass frame. So out of the momenta of the outgoing particles, you construct a jet shape variable, uh, uh, which is you know, the modern jet shape variables. So this is like the, you know, the ancestor, the progenitor of uh, uh, a number of modern jet shape variables. So, so this is not fragmentation function, it's just a shape variable. So for example, it's the kind of thing that people today use to tell a quark jet from a gluon jet. Other questions or comment? No? Maybe, maybe I just uh, if I can add this. Uh, um, I, I became aware of this the other day by discussing with my colleague in Milan, Giancarlo Ferreira, who, who is teaching a course on the standard model, and he was using some notes given to him by Stefano Catani, where in the notes by Catani, there is uh, this expression, and, and, and he said, well, this was originally proposed by Parisi. And then, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, I was just thinking to Stefano Catani, he was doing something like that uh, some 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah of, course, of course. This was then developed in uh, in in the nineties, basically, uh, when when at people at Hera starting doing started doing Hera jets. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, thank Stefano again. Yeah. Thanks very much, and we now have a coffee break outside, so you can go and eat and drink.